And we have depended on not only plant sources, but also animal sources and various other sources for our clothing needs. This is history, but there is evidence that clothing was worn since the ancient times. And if it's seen, it is references, there are references even in the Vedas about the gold fabric, gold that was used in fabric. And for centuries, weaving was known. Textile coloration was known. So from the uh, paintings, from the caves, you can make out that these were natural colors which exist even today. We can see from the paintings that they wore garments which were draped. You can see from the fine draped garments, you can see the drapes, you can see the ornaments and so on. So we know what was worn then. We came a long way using fibers and we were depending completely on natural fibers till such a time that we had two world wars. That's the, that was the game changer because there was a lot of shortage of natural uh, materials to clothe ourselves. And we had, there was a need to find alternate sources of textiles. So that's how um, it's not even 100 years since uh, polyester got commercialized. Uh, then we also depended on wood-based products like uh, cellulose, uh, and now we have lyocell, tensile, and so many other wood-based uh, products still running. But 1941, when polyester was uh, commercialized, it changed a lot of things. Not only with polyester, when the other fibers came, the dyes that were used for the natural fibers could not be used for synthetics. And therefore, if there was a need to change and find new solutions to cul for the coloration. Coloring acetate rayon, that's how this first dyes came into existence and so on. And so new dyes came, new chemicals came into existence to uh, color them. Interestingly, the first synthetic dye for coloration of textiles was found accidentally by Sir William Perkin in 1856. He was not a colorist but he was a pharmacist and he was trying to find out a, a remedy for malaria. And it was by accident that he came upon finding the first synthetic dye, which was called mauve. And it was de definitely used for the Queen Victoria and it got associated with the royal, the color for royalty. Now we have over 3000 Pantone shades, Pantone, CSI, are color, color, you know, color index. They have indexed certain colors, given them a code, which anybody can replicate from anywhere in the world. And we have spectrophotometers to measure them. But talking of mauve, it so happened that when I was looking up Pantone colors, I came upon this is the color that is predicted to be the color of the year 2023. So we will see more of more in the coming times. Coloration can be done at the fiber stage, yarn stage, fabric stage, but before coloration, there is a lot of processing that has to go, uh, the, the fabric has to go through. And that's called wet processing. If you see in the next slide, all this wet processing is only at one stage here. So yarn production, so all that you process that you saw the list, it's just happening at one stage so that there are many, many processes. And for any uh, textiles or fashion value chain, there are a lot of inputs. There's a lot of uh, raw materials that go in. There's a lot of energy that goes in. And what are we left with are emissions, which can, pollute the nature, which have polluted the nature, polluted the soil, water of not only the rivers, sea, and many more. And there have been, it's not only the fabric that is ready, there's also chemical finishes to textiles, which are used to improve their wearability, their appearance, functionality. And you can see a lot of finishes that are listed here and 
certain chemicals which were not very environmentally friendly were being used. Now this we did not knowing the harmful effects. So we've already done the harm in all these years and during our lifetime, we have used such materials. Probably they are even still there in our wardrobe and we do not know, we cannot undo the dye from the fabric. It's become a part of the fabric. So when we dispose of clothes, it is not only the um, textile material, it is also the chemicals and the coloring part. So we have two or more, many, many challenges. And this has doubled over the years because our lifestyle changed. Uh, because of urban growth, overconsumption, we had more income to spend. And we said, oh, I'm bored with that dress. So let me buy a new one. I don't want that sari. Let me buy another one and another one and another one. And our wardrobes just went. And we had no plans of disposing or any means of disposal. So fast fashion, that is what it was called. It was cheaply made and people did not mind spending another one and buying more because it was cheap and the fashions change very fast. Unlike seasons like the Western uh, countries follow, like the spring summer collection and then they have an autumn winter collection, summer collection and etc. Uh, in India, we followed seasons and festivals. So it added and multiplied. Now, th this became a bigger problem. I can hear a little buzz. Am I audible clearly? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So fast fashion became a challenge. And now we realize that what have we done? The online shopping has become even more, you know, because you sit at home, you don't even have to go to the mall and you just have to sit home and it gets delivered home. So we have really not worried. We have not bothered about the disposal part. And our landfills are just growing into mountains. And we do not know what kind of toxic chemicals are um, coming out and uh, it's, it's the air pollution has reached uh, very high levels. So the best way, the most favored option is to reduce, reduce the waste. Try to reuse, recycle and recover so that it can be recycled. We all have, uh, are going through the negative impact in various areas of the apparel industry. And this is the second most polluting industry next to the chemical industry. So these chemicals not only used for uh, uh, textiles, but also for the pharmaceuticals and coloration in particular, not only for textiles, but for leather, paper, uh, paints, and many, many other products. So second polluting industry, and we are facing the, um, consequences already with the climate change. So what is the solution for mitigating this environmental impact? Even a child will say, you know, recycle, reuse. Children know this, these three R's, but now we have expanded these a little further uh, all over the world. And we are now moving from a linear economy where we use, take, make, and consume and dispose we are moving to a circular economy where we can recover and reuse these raw materials either in the same circle or maybe uh, it, uh, the waste becomes a raw material for the next product cycle. So the way we look at waste management has changed. The entire paradigm has shifted and look at the landfill, how it was when it was linear economy. And now we have there is so much emphasis on recovering a reduction at source, recovery, and the minimum so that there is zero waste, there is zero di liquid discharge from the textile industry. And the effort for this is going on. Textile companies are doing a lot of work on, regarding this. They are restricting chemicals, they are restricting the, optimizing their processes, We're trying to use minimum energy, zero liquid discharge. Uh, you know, they're trying to make salt free dying and so many other uh, initiatives have been taken. So from fast fashion, we are now looking at 
slow fashion in a new way, with a new perspective. When it says slow fashion, um, it, it is to do with something that is choosing this Diwali shopping. Maybe we can choose something that is more sustainable, which is more long lasting so that it will last longer. So the quality has to be good and it has to be made in such a way that it has to be ethically prepared, you know, fair production. So it may be a little more costlier than others, but if we use basic styles, something that they will not go out of fashion, it can be used for a longer time. And it also has the opportunity to be used as a second hand later. So you can easily pass it on to somebody else who will use it. Now, looking at the demand, this was the recent, most recent uh, June 2022 report of um, uh, uh, which came out. And uh, you can see the forecast in the apparel industry. It has been rising over the years, but just because of the pandemic, there was a little dip, but you can see that the predicted or the forecasted is still um, going to be in the next few years, there is still going to be a demand for clothing, which is going to be rising. Now, the change is that the demand is going to be more for sustainable fashion. This is according to a global consumer survey. I don't have the statistical data because I have not subscribed to this, but we know that the curve is an up, upward curve for sustainability. So people are realizing the importance of sustainability. We all know sustainability is um, not compromising um, the ability for few, so that we keep something for the future generations. And for this, we balance all the three social, environmental, and economical, uh, these being the pillars of sustainability. So sustainability uh, in waste recovery models are coming into place in the industry. And as I mentioned, we were earlier in the fast fashion era, we were using linear economy. Then we said recycle and reuse, but now it is getting more circular so that there is no waste as, as far as possible. For this circular fashion or circular economy, there are two approaches. One, the transitional approach where we can use the textiles that we have, we can reuse by redesigning them, either by services or the materials that we use. So we can have redesigning services. There are people who will redesign your clothes for you and make it look different and new. So that is a transitional approach. You're using the same garment, but you're using it in a different way. Or you're combining two garments and making it look something new, different. The second hand, it's also um, the opportunity to have a business potential for second hand clothes. Uh, there are a lot of um, such second hand and uh, pre-owned and pre-loved uh, shopping uh, shops abroad, but we do not have it in India as much as, it's not as, as popular. We do, it's, it is available. There are also leasing models, like you can rent out, which this is catching up in a big way in India, where you can rent clothes for a wedding and not purchase and invest lakhs of rupees and then not wear it and it just remains. So um, these models are coming up. The second model, that's the transitional model, but the circular model is where there is an opportunity for that garment to be recognized and reused at any point of time during the life cycle. So for this, we will need to have a kind of a traceability system. We'll need some kind of barcoding where we can understand uh, how to recover and it can be you know, even saved having an ID. And right from the beginning, during the manufacturing stage, if this is done, it is a better uh, proposition. Now, uh, looking at this traceability, this is what will come in the future now, is registering. The first thing is registering and traceability in the textile and clothing supply chain. So all the information about how this garment, the shirt or the t-shirt was made will be printed on the sleeve or on any part of the garment, uh, along with all the information, 
So you have a traceability code, a tracking code and a secure code, which is fed into the uh, product data server. And then you have can verify at any stage in the garment life cycle, you can verify if the details are there for you, um, the product information is available uh, through this barcode, then you know the product is, in, it is authentic. And if there is no information, you know it's a counterfeit. So this traceability will have to start right from the farm stage. Um, in, U, in the US, they have already started. So you can trace by, you can track the history of the garment just by scanning. And uh, you can find where was it grown? Where was the yarn made? Where was the fabric woven on it? Where was it manufactured? Who made the apparel? Where was it made? Uh, who was who are the retailers and when it the consumer can have a track all these things so when the garment is disposed the person who takes it also can track from where it has it come so a lot of responsibility is with the retailer and the consumer we have no control over the retailer but we do have control over our, over ourselves as consumers so we play a lot of important role in the entire supply chain because we are the ones who consume, the ones who demand, and the ones who dispose. So this is totally in our control. And if we are more responsible and conscious while disposing of, so that's the best thing to happen. So the product responsibility is not only with the consumer. It has to be with designers because the designer has to design in such a way that at the end of the life, the product is recyclable. So while selecting the raw materials also, care has to be taken. The brands also need to take responsibility of what are the chemicals that they are putting into the product. How are they going to be producing it? Is it ethically made? All this responsibility lies with the brands. The managers in the garment factories also have need to understand whether they are treating their staff fairly, ethically. Uh, so each processing houses, of course, because they are the ones who are putting in all those, the water, the energy, the chemicals, and etc. And finally, as I said, we as consumers have a responsibility of how we are disposing of our waste. So what do you do to your clothes? What happens? So when you're tired of a clothes or it has torn, or what do you do with it? Do you donate? Is it passed on? Is it gifted? Or do you exchange it for a value? There are selling options. One, you of course you have online, uh, you can, you know, you can uh, eBay and there are many options of doing and selling you all you need to click and upload the picture and quote a price. So there will be buyers. But in India, we have this unique system, which is not there in other countries. In fact, uh, this paper has been appreciated a lot when I have presented that in India, this has unique where we had a door-to-door -door collection. When the gated, when we shifted to multi-story buildings and gated communities, it became difficult for them to um, contact the con consumers. But so now you can see them at strategic points. They will wait and they are prepared to take clothes in exchange for um, vessels, utensils, plastic items, and so on. What do they do? They process it so that it is suitable for the um, for the for reselling. And there are so many clothes, uh, people who are depending on these clothes. There's an entire lane. There are actually, it, this, this is, these are the images of my research in Chor Bazaar. Uh, this is seven o'clock in the morning. You can see how much work has already happened at seven. All the washing, re dyeing, repairing, stitching, washing, ironing, and all that. So, this is for resale. So we should be refusing to throw. We don't. Generally, we believe in Vastradhan and that is a good practice that we have this tradition of Vastradhan and we just give away. 
if not to anybody, to the maid who will decide what to do with it. This, is, this has been a practice. But when you consciously give it to certain organizations who will use it, it's good because Goonch, um, the case study that I had done on Goonch, it is mainly they prepare, they are pre very well prepared for disaster management. So they have kits. So if there are sudden floods or any kind of disaster anywhere in India, they have a very good network, how they have tied up with the, it's a model. There are people from Harvard who have come and done research on how they have prepared this network for uh, collection. Every city almost has this uh, collection center. They have volunteers uh, and the tie up with many companies. There are also um, commercial models like this is uh, uh, that's my shop. This is one company where you have your clothes. You ha just have to iron them, click a picture and send it to them. And they will, they will see the picture and they will evaluate. So they'll fix a time on your mobile and tell you what time they will come. It's an app that you can download. During the lockdown, they had to uh, send their uh, staff away because none of the colonies would entertain these people. Um, so now they are in the process of restarting and they are starting from the first week of December. But this is also an app which can be downloaded on phone and then you click picture and tell them so you can dispose of any item not only textiles so rethink repair rethink whether whatever kind of wardrobe it is uh, you can rethink before selling uh, before or uh, donating or uh, reuse so there are nine levels of circularity and this has been extended so it's like a hierarchy and so if you see it, refuse to throw away, rethink before you dispose of and reuse in whatever way possible, either the transitional approach or the circular approach, repair and use, refurbish, remanufacture, okay, re repurpose and recycle, recover. Now, the three R's, these are the totally nine R's, but refurbish, remanufacture and repurpose and recycle. These four R's are also um, for products which can be downcycled or upcycled. Means if you are making a product which is better than it was, then it, it's definitely called upcycling. So these are terms that have been used in the some of these in the last few years. Let me take a small poll here. Maybe there were, you are very few of you, you could unmute and tell your answer. Which of the nine R's would you categorize this floor rug? You may have seen it. It's nothing but the knitting uh, unit waste. And there are strips of these knitted fabrics which are woven with coarse yarns as the warp and very commonly used. And you will see them in uh, Ludhiana, um, Koimaturi, Road, Bangalore, uh, or um, even any of these. Tirupur is the main center, so you get a lot of waste like this. So what do you think, which category of R would you put this in? Anybody, you can unmute. Remanufacture. Repurpose. Yes. Repurpose. Okay, that's good. Reuse and repurpose. Recycle. Or reuse, reuse and recycle. recycle. Yeah. Yeah, recycle too. Yes. Okay. I'll give you examples of recycle also. But uh, whoever said uh, repurpose, uh, you're right. Okay. So you're finding a new purpose for it. There are also saris converted to dress materials, which um, are a uh, uh, common commonly done in households. And it has been run from for generations. Uh, the Godadis that uh, uh, the Sudeka was mentioning, this is also a, now the main center, very interesting to note that Norris in her book in 2010 has researched on uh, clothing, how the clothing recycling in India in 2010 when she published, she's identified just behind the Red Fort. There's a big market where tourists come, it's backpackers. And all the saris that are collected 
from various sources are converted into dresses, uh, wrap around skirts and halter dresses for these backpackers to pick up and then uh, they don't carry too many clothes. They will use them there and they will leave them before they move on to the next place. So there are, they are cheaply available. Uh, so also in Pushkar and wherever there are all these tourist centers, you will find these clothes which have been repurposed. Recycle is this where you collect the clothes and probably you cannot reuse them in any way. They're so damaged that you can't do anything out of it but either cut and make something or shred them completely. This, these are the shredded fibers. If you shred them by sorting according to different colors, the value is more because then you can get a fabric, say red fib fabrics together, green together, and you can segregate. And then there's no uh, necessity of re this. This is colored as it is. So the sorting becomes very crucial in any kind of collection. So this is quite a um, labor-centric job, but then um, the entire town of Almo uh, Amroha in Uttar Pradesh is involved in this kind of work. So this, these are images from a part of my study that I have done. How uh, after making it into a fibrous form, these are made into coarse yarns and made into um, floor covering, bed covers, etc. Even tufted rugs in tufted sets and these sets are exported. This was mechanical recycling where we were shredding but the second method is chemical recycling where you must have seen plastic bottles, water bottles, the bisleri bottles as they call them. These are PET, um, PET um, and these bottles are collected, the labels are separated, the lids are separated because there are, there's color in it and these are Again, process, the they made into flakes and the fl flakes are then made into chips and then spun into a yarn. This is chemical recycling and a lot of PET waste is utilized for a number of purposes. Now, this kind of yarn and fabric are used even for making t-shirts, denim jeans, etc. So, it's from a bottle to another product, which is t-shirts. So, this is chemical recycling. Could you please uh, uh, mute yourself? Of these uh, corporates which collect the waste, uh, there are examples of uh, pantaloons uh, which had uh, big bins where they collect, but this is not often. H&M does it, Shopper Stop does it, Big Bazaar used to do it, uh, but it's once in a way. But we, we cannot rely on or wait for these uh, such uh, occasions. We need to have a systematic uh, way of disposing of. And remanufacturing is a big, uh, people, there are, this book, Remake It, it's 2012 edition, uh, but uh, it has a compilation of at least 23 designers who have created their own brand just by remanufacturing. It's from clothes to bags to shoes to whatever and various different articles. There's just one uh, example that I saw in, uh, this is Mumbai. Uh, so there are, uh, there's a lot of research going on on this on remanufacturing fashion. And most of this research is from the European countries. Uh, so sustainability, we all know sustainability uh, goals, there are 17 goals and all industries, everybody is mm. in, inclined to follow these goals because there is a deadline. The deadline is now extended to 2030, but um, these sustainability, India has, Indian companies have also taken a resolution under this sure sustainability resolution. Uh, and there's a list of companies who took a pledge that they will use sustainable practices. This was during the LACME Fashion Week of 2019. Later, many companies got added on and they have committed that they will be com completely sustainable to, to up to 20, 
30. Uh, if you see the internet, there are so many ethical and sustainable clothing brands all over the world. And these are just one of, uh, I've just put these as examples, but if each of their website, you can get in what way do they say they are sustainable? What kind of certification has been given? Since when have they been, uh, uh, they have uh, initiated this, uh, taken these steps? And there's a lot of information that you go but these are some of the international brands that you see all over uh, on the internet. There are also in India. Fab India is one of them. And you may have heard about a lot of these that you see, uh, like uh, Khadi Kal, Label, Anoki, so many. Uh, you have a lot of labels. They call themselves labels, but all sustainable fashion brands. Ethicus is from Coimbatore. And the, there are many more, but I have only taken a few. Let's see what these big brands are doing. They also cannot stay away. They have been, uh, had, have started maybe 2014. So I've given the year when they started. So whatever development has happened in this circularity has taken place in, in the last, say, eight years, not, not 10 years also. Because we've talked of sustainability for a long time. The sustainability um, definition was given in 87, but it has taken us so long to understand that it, how important this is. So uh, H&M has been doing a lot and they did a lot of recycling and they were also suppliers to the Summer Olympics of 2016. Nike has... has uh, Two collections only on sustainability. Nike Grind started as early as 90s. So they were quite the pioneers in starting recycled and uh, completely circular economy using recycled material in their collection. There are many other brands like Speedo where they use the nylon and Econyl. Econyl is also a um, recycled material, but they combine and they manufacture swimwear collection. Then there is aqua fill. They collect uh, nylon six from various sources, both post-consumer and pre-consumer. And they have de developed a network in many countries from where they can collect. And this after sourcing, they are using it for preparing econyl nylon yarn, which they supply to uh, companies uh, for uh, making their products. Now, this nylon is not only um, from uh, fishing nets, which were discarded in the sea, but they're also from post-consumer waste, the carpet fluff that we discard our carpets, that's also a source. There are many other companies who have uh, talk of circularity and sustainability by reducing water, chemicals, energy in their production, and they're using uh, recycled yarn to prepare garments. So, from North Face is one. So an example of carpet recycling, I'm not, these are the, just the examples of certain brands and the well-known brands, what they are doing. But what happens to the carpets, which are even more voluminous? Maybe the, the it's, it may not be used so much in India, but yes, wall-to-wall uh, -wall carpeting is done in many of the offices and the hotels, and they need to change it at some point of time and when wear and tear cannot be helped. But what happens to them? They found ways of reutilizing them and these are kind of upcycled to make different products, either by injection molding and making it into tiles and many other uses. Part of my research again, where uh, this is from Amroha, where uh, garments, uh, the color, uh, the waste, Industrial waste can be sorted according to color so that you get uh, colored raw material which is shredded and it can be spun into yarns and made into dharis and case and uh, so many other products. This is uh, a study. The products are from the Panipat market because Panipat is a big center where this is done not only for the clothes that are from India, but they also source clothes from uh, which are discarded, which are shipped to Kandla port and they utilize them. Shirting fabrics, whatever is left over, it is bleached 
This is not a very ideal process, but it is because the dye chemical remains there and just if that it gets discolored. So the coloration has gone, but the basic component remains in that. Pre-consumer waste used for medical textiles. Again, these fabrics are from industries. All they do is shred them, prepare them and uh, pack them again for uh, surgical cotton. This is a virgin material. Then there is denim waste, which can be used for a number of uses. Um, uh, one example is the interiors of cars, the headliners and the interiors at different places. So all these are molded along with a um, low melting polymer. They mix something so that it can be molded and uh, made into. Even at the garmenting level, there's a lot of work being done to reduce the uh, number, the wastage. So moving towards less, reducing the waste, they're using on computer, they use how to lay the garment in such a way that there will be minimum waste because fabric is cut in layers. It may be 80 layers, 100 layers, all together are cut at the same time of different sizes. So it may be XL, double uh, XL, small, medium, all that. So they've laid in such a way and it is planned so that there is minimum waste. So whatever little waste is there, there should be an opportunity to recycle and reuse it within the industry. So you can see here how important uh, at each stage, right from the raw material to the user, the user becomes a crucial point because from the user is what we get, you know, from the manufacturing and from the user, a lot of, uh, uh, you can source a lot of material. I've already talked of borrowing, inheriting, swapping, but also leasing and second-hand models, but fibers which can be, cannot be used at all. Uh, of course, incineration is the option where you can recover energy or electricity for doing any kind of processing further. So fibers which can be converted into different, I've already talked of bottles being uh, reused in the chemical recycling. Uh, just touching upon green laundry, because uh, this is a new concept that is coming, green laundry, because we are now using a lot of chemicals in our washing also. There's electricity, there's water, and the laundry detergent. In addition, there are softeners and stain removers, bleaches, uh, and other chemicals, so many other chemicals. It's not only the chemicals, it's also the packaging that is uh, also going as waste. So uh, we are trying to become a little more conscious of how much are we using. So uh, even companies who are make, making these equipment are also trying to optimize the level of water, the level of you know, how much you can use by call, causing so that there's minimum pollution. And uh, greenhouse gases are released uh, to generate electricity, which are necessary to operate these devices. So whatever wastewater is also a byproduct and that also may have certain micro uh, fibers which can uh, get discharged into the water bodies and into the soil. And of course, it gets into our food chain finally. So it's a cause for concern. So uh, um, I know of Dow Chemicals, which is trying to develop detergents which do not need the second rinse and the detergent can be washed off in a single rinse, something like that. So there's a lot of research going on in this field, but this is uh, something which I wanted to touch upon. Softeners, all softeners are not uh, environmentally friendly, dry cleaning agents are basically solvents, which give no option. There is no other option but to dispose of, and it's not a, and so when there's nothing to do, dry cleaning should be the kind of last option when there's no option left. Uh, either save water. So try to minimize the number of times that you would give go to the laundry to dry clean because these solvents are also not very good. So there's a new field of textiles that is coming up, which is, you know, people are getting more conscious about wellness textiles. 
So people are moving towards sustainable fibers. The demand for sustainability is increasing with sustainable textiles. So now the natural people are moving towards uh, um, more natural fibers, the natural dyes, finishes, eco-friendly finished fabrics, herbal finishes, and um, Ayurvastra products. I'm not that I'm promoting Ayurvastra, but uh, I'm just saying that these are available for consumers. So if people want to go become green in their uh, textile consumption, in their use and in their disposal, there are many, many options that can keep us well. So um, this is my summary. I'm just summarizing the key points, what we covered. We started with the evolution of, of uh, uh, clothing and the textile industry, how fast fashion affected us still the United Nations had to develop these goals in 2016 when they were implemented and how it has changed after that, what changes have happened and what how it could impact the future also. The impact on our disposal, we've seen the waste hierarchy, what are linear models, use throw models, and now how we are moving towards circ circular economy. And to become circular in our daily lives also, we use... Um, we can use circularity, the nine R's. It's not only companies and brands who are doing, I've given examples of these, how companies are uh, using the nine R's and uh, how these are structured to the fashion value chain. We talked about uh, the new paradigm shift for managing waste, the new models, the transitional and the circular model and what practices the brands are sustainable practices and the brands, what are they doing? New production technologies that they have developed and what is coming is traceability. You must know, one day you will know just by uh, scanning the barcode, where the cotton was grown, where the yarn was made, where was it knitted, where was it dyed, what was the dye used, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then green laundry, this is what we have covered today. And uh, I'm now open to questions. Thank you for your patient listening. And I'll leave you on this slide for some time because now that we move from to slow fashion, we are looking at, you know, be vocal for local, local sourcing so that we spend less on transport, uh, reducing, managing waste, becoming little more environmentally conscious. Please do. Uh, I hope this will not discourage you from your, um, uh, Diwali shopping or whatever festival shopping that is coming. But then I think we can be more conscious about what we take. We will uh, rather choose something that is durable, long lasting, and we will be uh, still supporting sustainability. Thank you. Any questions? Dr. 